Well, it didn't take long for the inevitable to happen. As I was pulling out from a junction, there was some grinding, a couple of loud knocks before a complete loss of power. I could get it in gear and rev the engine, but nothing was going to the wheels. Instead, there was this horrible noise coming from the transfer box. The cause was fairly obvious, too much weight. I'd fitted a roof rack and tent box earlier that week before going to collect a couple of solid steel axles and a set of very heavy cast iron wheels for a future project. In total, around 500 kilograms of extra weight. Unintentionally, I'd forced the Land Rover into a stress test, which it had almost immediately failed. After sharing a video on Instagram, a handful of people all replied with the same diagnosis. The output shaft had gone. A badly designed part which you can't lubricate and so quickly wears out, especially when towing. Two and a half hours later, I was picked up by a recovery truck and began the long journey back to London. <laughs> the truck dropped me outside a garage near to where I live, but unfortunately that didn't really work out, so I then had the additional challenge of getting the Land Rover back to my street so it wouldn't start collecting parking tickets. After buying some tow ropes, which I probably should have already had, I rented a zip van and with some much needed help, towed it all the way home through southwest London on a rainy Friday night, with the heavy cast iron still inside. Eventually, I found a specialist Land Rover garage who could put it right within a week, but at the eye-watering cost of £1,200. The repair is actually an upgrade to a redesigned part that does away with the failed joint entirely. The only silver lining of the whole episode is that the upgrade is supposedly bulletproof and will never fail again. Once I had it back, I began fitting some easier upgrades. So pressing the clutch on a Land Rover is like using a leg press machine. In stop-start traffic, it's really quite unpleasant to drive, particularly for me as I have this autoimmune disease which attacks my hips and spine. But there is a solution. You can change out the original spring for one which is supposedly 45% stronger, making the clutch almost half as heavy. Both this and the new output shaft are made by the same company, Loft Clutches. Getting that green spring in was not simple. But it's definitely made a difference. There were also a few things I needed to sort out with the rear door. The first was replacing this rubber conduit that someone's dog had clearly liked the taste of. What I'd expected to be a simple job turned into something quite drawn out as I had to cut the wires to slip the new rubber on before then reconnecting them. I used these connectors which already have solder inside, removing a lot of the faff of a soldering iron, especially for wires in awkward positions. I didn't get a good shot of it at the time, but this is what it looks like. The next issue was the door card. You may remember from the previous video that this yellow drawer latch was preventing the door closing with the card on. The easiest and cheapest option was just to drill a hole, which I had to enlarge a few times due to some poor aiming. Another issue was this door stay mechanism that gets in the way of the opening to the side of the drawer, which was actually a design compromise, but is in fact quite handy for storing longer things. An alternative is this gas strut system from Bison Auto, which instead mounts to the top using a couple of metal plates and doesn't require any drilling. And I'll leave links for all these products in the description. Thank you. 
Under the front of the Land Rover there is the steering system. It's quite exposed when driving off-road. A badly placed rock could potentially disable your steering, so an easy solution is to install a guard plate such as this. A similar thing are these grills to protect the headlamps. These do require some drilling into the aluminium, so I bought this small bottle of touch-up paint to put on any exposed edges. The standard bulbs in Defender headlamps are pretty rubbish at night, especially in the countryside, and people often swap them out for LED ones. Instead I decided a light bar would be more useful. It's 52 inches long and is mounted to the Land Rover gutters using these brackets. To wire it in you have to take apart most of the dashboard, but that was a job for another day as I was just about to drive out to France. Since Brexit you have to put a UK flag on your number plate when in the EU. You can use these stickers which don't look very tidy, so I coughed up for a new number plate set instead. A very common sight in Defenders is a worn out seat box mat, particularly around the corners. To prevent that from happening you can install these stainless steel protectors. And that's it, at least for the moment. The next task was getting out to France. Usually when I go, I travel light, i.e. hand luggage on a Ryanair flight. But this year's different. I'd be driving down with all those cast iron wheels, the two solid steel axles, as well as a workshop load of tools that I'd been slowly amassing in preparation for what's coming later this year. Naturally, I didn't want a repeat of the earlier breakdown, so after shopping around for a few days, I collected this little trailer, built in 2005, rated for 600 kilograms and which cost 350 quid. Back in London, I began loading everything up. In a way, this was now my stress test. After causing the first breakdown by overloading the Land Rover, I was now expecting to add even more weight and then drive 800 miles cross country in three days. The earlier breakdown was definitely a much needed wake up call to take things a bit more seriously. The first leg was to catch a four hour ferry from New Haven to Dieppe, which cut out some miles if I'd gone through Calais. The trip began bright and early the next day. After stopping for some essentials, we encountered rain which quickly turned torrential. I'd actually put my knee into one of the wipers whilst fitting the tent box and it was now wobbling all over the show. Not the sort of thing you want flying off for 60 miles per hour. We stopped for the second night just north of Poitiers in a campsite found using the park for night app. Having the tent box took the pressure off trying to find a room with secure parking to spend the night in. Each campsite cost less than 15 euros to stay at. In fact, the only big cost was diesel as we stayed off France's wildly expensive auto routes. Towards the middle of the third day, there were some suspicious noises coming from the back of the Land Rover. 
I worried that the suspension was struggling under the weight of it all, but after putting some grease onto the tow hitch, the sound disappeared. If you ever drive through France, definitely take the scenic route. It's slower, but you'll see beautiful towns and countryside. However, the quality of the roads isn't perfect, and that was taking a toll on the trailer. About 600 miles in, and with at least 150 still to go, I noticed a problem. This is actually a tipper trailer, and the only thing that holds the front down is a bolt and nut which clamps onto this minuscule tab. Too many bumps had twisted the trailer out of alignment. A few millimetres more and it would have dumped everything into the path of anyone behind us, and ripped the trailer in two. A very scary thought. A quick fix with a ratchet strap and I drove the remaining hours watching out for potholes and speed bumps. It's been a long time since I've been back here, nearly six months, and that's the reason why there's not been much activity on this channel. Making it out here with all these tools and equipment is an important milestone. I'll be here for a couple of weeks to see my parents before starting the final leg of this trip, once I've fixed the trailer, or replaced it. And thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. If you're traveling this summer, there's a good chance you could benefit from their VPN. It allows you to connect to the internet via 100 countries around the world. That's useful if you need to access accounts or content that are geo-locked, such as Glastonbury on the BBC iPlayer. It may even save you money on flights and hotels, which can be cheaper if booked from a local IP address. More importantly, Surfshark offers protection for your device if connecting to public Wi-Fi networks, as well as antivirus software which will scan your computer for malicious files. I've been using a VPN for many years now, and having it ready to go in the back pocket has been a lifeline on more than one occasion. Surfshark offer a 30-day risk-free period, so in the event you don't like it, you can get your money back, no questions asked. Plus, if you use the code Carl Rogers, you'll receive an extra three months completely free. So go to surfshark.deals forward slash Carl Rogers and make sure you're protected whatever you're up to this summer. Thanks for watching.